My lords, honoured guests, pray silence please for the response to the last address to be given by the Lord Khalid Hamid, your guest of honour. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am very grateful for this opportunity to talk to you. And when my friend Dr. Ramir Ranger asked me to prepare a speech for you, I studiously got down and jotted some thoughts. Now it's getting on, and therefore I shall edit as I go along what I have to say. The main area of my interest is medicine, but apart from medicine, I do speak publicly on my other favorite area of interest, which is interfaith. Of late, ladies and gentlemen, our society has become increasingly concerned for our physical security from the threats of extremists and terrorists. Attention has been particularly focused in the direction of the radical elements from the followers of Islam, from where mainly the recent atrocities have come. To prevent our world from moving from one crisis to another, we need to reassess the relationship between Islam and others. As human beings, we are all more alike than different irrespective of our physical makeup and self-created labels, which might suggest otherwise. The challenge before us is to respect, value and understand others without compromising the bedrock of our own faith. Can we therefore, by so, so doing, seek to light a small candle of hope rather than extend the considerable darkness around us. One of the challenges of our time, as we set out at the beginning of the 21st century, is whether modern people living in both Islamic and other cultures can coexist on this planet. <clears throat> After the device of the Soviet Union in 1992, Francis Fukuyama of the United States State Department predicted that with the fall of communism, capitalist liberal societies are the end product of the historical process of mankind. He predicted that the days of Islam are numbered, leading to its demise as a major world religion. Soon afterwards, Samuel Huntington from Harvard University warned in his book, The Clash of Civilizations, that future wars will not be between nation states, but between civilizations, and that the Chinese and Islamic civilizations were a challenge to the West. From our own shores, the eminent Bishop of London, the Reverend Richard Charters, suggested, and I quote, suddenly it has become urgent to distinguish in our country between helpful and lethal religions and to find the way to initiate the young into the former rather than the latter. From the Islamic world, the renowned scholar Professor Akbar Ahmed explained the present disorder in community relations as symptomatic of globalization and international politics. It is therefore important to understand Islam post 9-11 in the early part of the 20, 21st century. The hijackers of the four planes on 9-11 not only killed thousands of innocent people, but also created a great paradox for Islam which sees itself as a religion of peace and is now associated with murder and mayhem. The West must understand Islam 
because of the sheer numbers of the followers of Islam around the world, there are presently about 1.5 billion Muslims living in 57 states. The projection for the year 2050 is a world population of 11 billion people, 25% of which will be Muslims. Presently, over 25 million of Muslims live in the West, of which 7 million live in the United States, 5 million in France, and about 2 million in the United Kingdom. Also, Muslim nations are indispensable to American foreign policy. One of the nine pivotal states on which the United States bases its foreign policy, five are majority Muslim states. Now, it's very important for us to understand how the Muslims look at the United States. Because it is a superpower. They see the emergence of the United States as the sole superpower and a new global imperialist driven by greed, mendacity, and stupidity. In their vision, the ugly American becomes the Hulk and is on the rampage. And in the words of Harold Pinter, like a beast in the jungle. Indian writer Arundhati Roy notes that the war on terror is driven not by the need to get Al-Qaeda, but to get Al-Fayda. <laughs> <laughs> The word Fayda, translated into English, means Al-Prophet. Analysts like these see a label of malicious, gnome-like figures who live in the half-light called Neocons and drive the American engine. Many Muslims believe that the savage cruelty and cynicism mirrored in the abuse of Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq, Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, and background in Afghanistan, as well as rendition flights, waterboarding, and other methods of interrogation are a consequence of the culture engendered by this leadership. This, more than anything, is the best recruitment sergeant for the terrorists. Since the late 20th century, the Muslim world has been plunged into the age of globalization, which to many resembles a new form of Western imperialism. Its emphasis is on producing the most goods at the lowest cost, along the way accumulating wealth and higher standards of living, for some, regardless of the cost to society. Neither faith, in its pure spiritual sense, <coughs> nor reason, based in classical notions of justice and logic, appears to figure prominently in the philosophy of globalization. The absence of faith and reason, along with the events of 9-11, have further distorted the West's approach to Islam. What has further affected the Western view of Islam is the ongoing drip feed of anti-Islamic statements by the media. The resultant product has been Islamophobia, with frequent use of the terms Muslim fundamentalist or Muslim terrorist. This is explained by the distinguished writer from India, M.J. Akbar, explaining what is a fundamentalist. A believer, he says, can only be true to his faith if he believes in its fundamentals. He explains that he fasts during the month of Ramadan, which is one of the five fundamental tenets of Islam. Does that make him a fundamentalist? He asks whether an Islamic society is ipso facto fundamentalist. No, he says, because the holy book of the Muslims, the Quran, repeatedly commends coexistence Lakum dinakum waliyadin. Your religion for you and my religion for me. And Laikra 
preordained that there be no compulsion in religion. 